Coming up, an interview with one of the greatest rock singers in the history of our planet. And today, he tells a story that's going to leave you dumbfounded. He once formed a supergroup with arguably the greatest guitarist of all time, and they were working on the first single. And this singer told this legendary guitarist that he was going to be the one playing the solo. Uh, so the world's greatest guitarist took a back seat and let the singer wail on the six string. Uh, the solo that you hear on today's number one rock song, it's actually the front man playing, not the greatest guitarist of all time. Find out the reason why this happened, what the song was. Also, we have another special guest on today's episode, a legendary rock producer who did some of the biggest records ever, including Aerosmith, Bon Jovi, and Metallica. Find out why he did this legendary singer's album for free, coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever bought candy cigarettes, pretending like you were James Dean puffing away, you're gonna dig this channel of pure musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you always know when our new ones drop. Also, check out our exclusive content on Patreon and our latest merch that helps us keep the music alive. So I'm really excited uh, for today's episode from one of Rock's most legendary singers and uh, one of the genre's greatest producers as well. Excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, where featured artists go deep on their greatest songs and albums. Seriously, stories you won't hear anywhere else with great insight. So Paul Rogers, the nails and gasoline voice that spun the rock genre on its head, you know, and the band Free, as well as Bad Company, he's with us again here, and he tells a story starting a super group of Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page. It was called The Firm in the 80s. Also had Tony Franklin, who would work with Kate Bush and David Gilmore, to name a few. And uh, he was on Fretless Bass, and Man for Man, Earth Band's drummer uh, Chris Slade, who, of course, would later drum for ACDC. Paul Rogers and Jimmy Page announced the band in 1984, and they released their self-titled debut, The Firm, in 1985. And of course, Jimmy Page, arguably the greatest guitar player ever. And many would say the same about Paul Rogers as a singer, including Freddie Mercury and Ann Wilson, to name a few. Uh, but apparently, Jimmy Page took a back seat on their first single, and the singer played the solo. Actually, a few stories about how this came about. Uh, one that's been told, uh, Paul Rogers said to Jimmy Page, and I quote, I'll be handling the solo on this one, Jim. Uh, it was a ballsy move, the singer benching the guitar player. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but there's actually a very good reason why, and Paul will explain in the interview. Although having two goats on the stage, you know, one with the microphone and one with the six string, uh, it would be like uh, Michael Jordan pinch hitting for Babe Ruth, right? But I digress. Coming up, we also have legendary rock producer Bob Rock, who's behind some of the biggest rock records ever, including producing a Black Album, Metallica, Dr. Feelgood uh, with Motley Crue, as well as engineering Bon Jovi, Slippery When Wet, and New Jersey, Permanent Vacation by Aerosmith. Bob just produced Paul Rogers' new album, and he actually did it for free. He's going to tell you why next. Now, as we go into it, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses I always wear. Right now, you can get up to 80% off regular retail prices, everything from reading glasses to progressive lenses to transition lenses and sunglasses. And you can add amazing features like blue blocks that protect your eyes from digital blue light. Make sure to click on our info button right up here to get the special POR price. Here's Paul Rogers and Bob Rock. Why do I like this record so much? And it's the Sonic. When I heard All Right Now, I can still tell you I was hitchhiking in Victoria up to Thetis Lake and I heard All Right Now on the radio, and I went, what is that? What is that? Why is that so good? So much better than everything I've heard. All right now, baby, it's all I said, you basically All Right Now, or cost off him, the rest of the guys. Uh, it was just, that was the door. That was, I was just opening the door. It's like, what I love, I guess my art form is really records. I love making records ever since that. You know, and then it goes to uh, Good Vibration. Good, good vibration and Honky Tonk Woman. Oh, it's all you know, all these, like, what is going on? And then, you know, being a queen lover, when I bought the Queen 2 album, 
I bought it and I put it on and I went, I don't know what's going on here. I have no idea what's going on, but whatever this is, I want to learn how to do this. And that, that started me. Just a love of records, right? You know, back when I'm so old that um, there was no FM, I'm before FM. I listened in my dad's car to AM radio. And that's when I heard Hendrix, Motown, uh, you know, Creedence Clearwater, everything, Sugar Pop, all, all that stuff. Radio was the thing. Sound. Why? You know, there. That's it. I told Paul that. I said, you know, All Right Now is one of the four cornerstones of 70s rock. It just, the guitar, the everything about it. It's a perfect song. You know, it's funny, the, um, the two songs, Honky Tonk Woman and All Right Now, both songs start with guitar and drums. And the bass comes in, bass comes in in the chorus, and that is a formula. People like Mutt Lang and all sorts of people use that, ACDC, et cetera. It's just this wonderful thing. Well, then you teamed up with your friend Jimmy Page to form the supergroup The Firm in 83 and 84. Even you this was during a period when, of course, John Bonham had passed away, and subsequently, Page, Plant, and Jones decided not to continue with Zeppelin. A lot of sadness and uncertainty in the aftermath of that, of Bonham's death, but the impetus of you and Jimmy pursuing the firm was when he asked you to write lyrics for some music that he recorded on a cassette. It was allegedly something he intended to be a Zeppelin song. Well, he didn't uh, didn't actually say that to me. He just said, well, what do you think of this? And uh, can you write some lyrics to it? And I said, well, I'll give it a shot. And uh, it was very long. It was a lot of, I, I got him to edit it down a little bit. And uh, it became Midnight Moonlight Lady. She flies through the night on silver wings. And uh, I said to him afterwards, you know, it's strange, but that chorus seems to have an extra beat in it, you know? Seems to be, he said, yes, it does. <laughs> it's times five or something, you know? So I was working with this thing that and it goes down, down, or something like that. And there's an extra beat there. So I had to kind of allow for it each time. Because I'm not very clever musically, actually. I'm not much of a mathematician. I, I usually think of music as like, it's cosmic maths. It's that kind of comes to you when you get these weird ideas and things. But it's not your actual self that's doing it somehow. Anyway, we did that and we went from there. And the, what happened was that um, the people that were organizing the arms tour, what turned out to be the arms tour, were they wanted to take the whole thing. They'd done a, a show at the Albert Hall and they wanted to take the whole thing to America. And I believe this happened. Steve Winwood didn't want to be there, part of it, um, in America. And so they needed another act to, to complete the bill. So they called, I don't know how they knew that Jimmy and I were in the studio, but they called us up and said, will you do, will you come out and do a show? And I said, well, we really, we've only got t 20 minutes of music. And they said, that's all we want. And I said, well, we don't even have a rhythm section. And they said, well, we'll get your rhythm section. And I said, all right, do you, do you want to do this? So we went, and, and that became the firm, actually. Uh, Jimmy was very keen to get out on the road, and we became the firm. And I was less keen because I'd just come off the road basically with from Bad Company and want, you know, live at home and make music do that way. And uh, he he said, look, I'll tell you, well, uh, I was less keen. So he said, um, we'll do two records. Let's do two records and we'll tour accordingly with those two records. And that'll be it. And I said, OK, and we shook on that. And that's what we did. Well, Radioactive, I want to ask you about that. When that came out, it was such a uh, a different feel that song specifically with your vocal, some production tricks and some things, especially when you listen to it in headphones, how you hear the way that you say radioactive. 
It was very, very well produced. It was just really cool to hear it in, in a new way, co-written by you and Jimmy. You enlisted the talents of, of Tony Franklin for the bass work, Chris Spade as a drummer. Both made significant contributions to Radioactive, that, that fretless bass hook and, and Slay with that intro that was so great. Yes, it did. Well, the producer was Julian Mendelssohn, uh, of the engineer, actually. And he had some great ideas. You know, we were, we were playing pool outside the control room and he came in and recorded that and he put some of that on me. He was very innovative and he, he used ideas like that. So he was very good. Chris Slade was fantastic with the opening drums. Tony Franklin, yeah, the bass player, was wonderful. I mean, he used a fretless bass, so he was playing very twangy bass guitar. And uh, I think I actually played the solo on that. You did. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the most interesting stories about this is that you executed <laughs> the guitar solo, not Jimmy Page. <laughs> I don't know, I know. What a cheek, eh? What a nerve. Sorry. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, um, what that was is a finger exercise that Alexis Connor showed me. It's da 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 and I thought it sounded so robotic. It's not radioactive, but it's very robotic, you know. And I thought, well, that's great. I'll put that on forwards and backwards and upside down and in the ladies' chamber. And so that's what we did. So how did you convince uh, Jimmy <laughs> and have the confidence and courage to do that? Jimmy said, go ahead, you know. I mean, it was very hard to do it because the tempo, by the time we'd played it, it was a lot faster than <laughs> I was used to doing the exercise. So I, was, I had to work frantically at it. Don't just stand, stand to but uh, no, Jimmy was absolutely brilliant about it. Now that I think as well, you know, because I mean, there's Jimmy Page like, are you going to play the solo instead of me? He didn't say that, though, but uh, yeah. <laughs> How did you produce that kind of, you know, that eerie tone? I think, actually, I think Jimmy put some stuff on it, to be honest, as well. I think he did. I think he overlaid it, probably secretly, maybe. But I mean, I think he did it somehow. He's, he's gone, oh, are you doing that? Okay. And he's done it and enhanced it. Yeah, for me, it's the most memorable part of the song. Very sinister, that song. It's uh, it's very cool. It's a different feel. I remember when I heard it and I, I bought the album as a kid after listening to Bad Company so much. It, it was uh, definitely... At first, I didn't I didn't like it, actually, on the first listen. But oh. then on the second listen, I was like, this is cool. And, and it and it became uh, a favorite after that. But it was something that kind of... It kind of disarmed me at first. It was a, uh -huh. being used to Bad Company. It was different. Yeah, it was very different. Well, it very different, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, the music video for Radioactive got a heavy MTV play. Yeah, this was a, a time where MTV was taking over. All of a sudden now, instead of just being a live act and a band, you actually had to be like a, a photogenic and a movie star and all that kind of thing. I remember that period, yeah. Were you and Jimmy active in the treatment for the video? Tell me about that. We were playing at the Hammersmith Audion, left the gear set up the next day. We filmed it uh, in front of our gear with all you know the stage setting that we were using for the, for the show. What were your thoughts when that was happening, the whole MTV thing? It was an extra dimension of pressure on you, really, to be honest. And so you had to allow for that. I mean, I remember the Satisfaction Guaranteed, we did, that was another one, too. And we did a, a sweaty southern place, the Les Paul, the man himself, who was the bartender in, in Satisfaction Guaranteed. You see him there showing the thing and wiping the, the bar down. Speaking of, of Jimmy Page and the firm, Jimmy Page, of course, one of the greatest guitarists ever. Yeah. But I don't think that he gets enough credit as an innovator. And you experienced this creativity firsthand. Well, you know, he had a guitar. He had it so that it would move one of the strings a little higher when he moved the uh, guitar on the strap. But very clever. Uh, it was very unique. So he could bend a string and then bend it some more by 
by just dropping his shoulder down. It was very good. This was developed by um, Gene Parsons and uh, Clarence White. If you play a note and you, and, and you just sort of, well, it's like that, you just put, <laughs> sort of, if you're holding it anyway. Yeah. Remember the pyramid laser that used to have came down? at this pyramid of green around him while he was playing a solo. And it, people would get used to that for a second and then it would switch, it would twist like this. It was amazing, you know. It was such a magical guitarist. He could lift the whole band, the whole place, the whole stadium with just a solo on his guitar. He could just, and I had the best seat in the house. Jimmy plays on the guitar. You could feel the, the everything rise, the spirit rise up above. It was great. I think your new album, Midnight Rose, is on par with some of your best stuff. Brought on board, uh, Bob Rock and Cynthia started to produce. She was doing a bit of production with the with the core tracks, but she got really serious with Bob Rock. And a brilliant job. I just wanted to ask you about work with Paul Rogers and new album Midnight Rose his first solo album in 25 years I know that Paul said it grew from sparks of ideas that he had had how did you capture some of that as you were working together somebody else started the record he did basically the basic tracks I got uh, Keith Scott from Brian Adams band and an amazing Chris Gestrin basically in two days we did all the guitars and all the keyboards and I talked to Paul and I said you know in 70s records and 60s records you know, the, in the verses, the guitar in the verses, none of the records people are making, nobody does that. Do you mind if Keith just does that? I said, sure. And it was just floored. So it really was about my listening to it and knowing what needed I needed to do to finish the record. And it was Paul Rogers. I mean, I told him the story about the hearing all right now, and I did it, I did it for free because I just wanted to be in the same room with Paul Rogers. Goes back to that the hitchhiking thing, right? He's such an amazing singer, such a gentleman. Cynthia and him are so beautiful. It was, just, it was amazing. So because I did it for gratis, he gave me this ring from 1973 where from Vancouver, a Haida Indian gave him that he wore every gig since that guy in 73. He wore that. He gave me that ring. Wow, that's amazing. Well, coming home, what well, comes in with that anthemic drumming, and it's a standout track for sure. Tell me about coming home. Well, coming home really is an ode to all the um, basically the first responders to any kind of problem that's going on, and they keep us safe. And really, it's it's for them. It's an ode to them. Hopefully, they come home safely. Well, let's talk about living it up. I'm living it up in the America's home of the blues. And the- you get to do a little tip of the hat to Otis Redding, Aretha, and Ray Charles, of course. Otis Redding, Aretha, and Ray Charles, too. And Ray Charles, too. I've still got the same copy I, I always used to, I had as a kid when I was like mm, about 14, 15. It's called Crying Time, and I still love that record. So Ray Charles is very much an influence. I know I haven't mentioned him earlier, but um, he definitely is. But Living It Up came up with a story told in three minutes about my journey, really, from Middlesbrough down to London and into America and how the impact of the music that America has given the whole world. world Blues, soul, rock and roll, jazz, country. It's gone around the world and it's been really positive and I wanted to it's my, my little thank you to America, really. Yeah, it's got it got a little Hendrix vibe to it, I, I felt. Well, that's not a bad thing. No, not at all. I loved it. Love that hate. And Keith Scott just nailed it, the guitars on that. He nailed all of it. The guitar work on that album is incredible. Paul, looking over your life, both professionally and personally, what are you most grateful for in this moment? 
oh, I'm grateful actually to be able to dance in the sun. I mean, I know that's that's you know it's one of the songs, but also dance in the rain, dance in the snow, dance in the clouds. Uh, I'm just grateful to be alive. Well, we're grateful that you're here. We're grateful for this music. I I, I got to tell you, really. Thank you so much for this interview, not only for the interview, but for the music. And your music has meant so much to me and to so many. So from the bottom of, of my heart, many, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Adam. Not bad for a kid from Middlesbrough. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Make sure to get Paul's new album, Midnight Rose, at the link below in our description. It's really great. Make sure to leave us a comment about Paul and his time with Bad Company and The Firm. What do you think about him playing the solo instead of Jimmy Page and Bob Rock doing the album for free? Let's t have a great discussion about Paul Rogers. How is he not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? It's, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Make sure to subscribe below if you like our channel. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.